coming up on this episode of Murky Seb's Wild Underwater Adventures. On this episode, we find some unique rock formations. We look at an island. We climb up a cliff. And we try and track down a really cool animal that I've wanted to find ever since I heard about them as a child. But will we be successful in finding a blue ringed octopus? We're here at a place called Fingal Head, which is one of only a few places in the world to have these unique hexagonal shaped rocks. It's called Fingal Head after a Scottish hero. And there's a place in Ireland called the Giant's Causeway, which is related to that Scottish hero. And there's a place there called Fingal's Cave. And because that's another place that has these hexagonal rocks, that's why this place got its name. Let's have a look at what might be living around these hexagonal rocks. These hexagonal rocks are known as columnar jointing, which forms as the volcanic rock called basalt cools and it fractures along the easiest path, which is why you get beautiful hexagonal structures. Basalt is a type of igneous rock composed of the minerals olivine, which is a green or yellow crystal made of magnesium, silicon and iron, plagioclase, which is a mafic mineral, which when found in basalt is usually the variety called augite, made from silicate containing calcium, iron and magnesium. And the final component is quartz, which is made from silicon dioxide. When you have a lava flow on the surface and it eventually stops flowing, it cools and forms the easiest geometric structure it can, which for these minerals is a hexagonal column. If you look really closely, you'll see green minerals and that's the olivine. Right by these hexagonal rocks were some cool little starfish. They had an awesome purple color and there were several of them living on these rocks. It was hard to spot them because of how well they blended in with these rocks. Despite their bright colors, their sort of model pattern fit in really well with the algae and surrounding rocks. These starfish will feed off the little bits of plant matter and algae growing on the rocks, as well as any microorganisms that they might encounter. Look how awesome the scales and pattern are on this little starfish. Check out what we found here. We have found, look at this, some species of starfish that's hanging out on these rocks. Isn't that a beautiful looking creature? He's got an ideal environment here. He can just hang out next to this seaweed, eating away at it. What a beautiful thing. You better put him back before he gets too annoyed by... He doesn't seem too bothered, but so he doesn't dry out, we'll put him back where we found him. There you go, little buddy. The starfish felt surprisingly rigid. I moved very slowly. 
and have an ideal home along these rocks. But we had to move on and have a look what was going on in these rock pools, which weren't very far away from the cliffs. And there were a lot of signs of life in these rock pools. And it just so happened that the first spot I looked in, we saw this amazing creature, which is a type of sea hare. There are hundreds of species of sea hare, some of which can grow up to 14 kilograms. As you can see, they have a soft body, large wings, which can be used for swimming. But what you can't see is their small internal bone, which can be seen if they're really scared and retract their mantle. When they are active, they have two ear-like appendages on their head, which is how they get the common name of sea hare. They look kind of like a rabbit or hare usually found in rock and tidal pools such as this one or shallow marine and brackish environments. Sea hares spend the majority of their day feeding on algae or seaweeds and pick up the pigments and sometimes the toxins found in the algae and seaweed. So they vary a lot in colour. They have the ability to squirt a purple dye that works as a smoke screen, enabling them to hopefully escape from any potential predators. They also have a slime coating that's toxic to protect them, but this varies a lot depending on the type of algae they eat, which means they have very few predators. They only live for about a year and form long chain-like groups during mating, in which they lay spaghetti-like eggs, usually in late summer, then die. They only live for a couple of years and are relatively common. Due to the risk of their toxic skin, it's best not to touch them. But if you see one that's out of the water, it's generally safe to pick them up and put them back in as long as you wash your hands immediately afterwards and don't touch your eyes or mouth. They can be found in large numbers washing up on beaches occasionally. And out of the corner of my eye, I spotted another one of these awesome sea hares. I'd been filming that first one for several minutes and hadn't even noticed this one sitting right beside it. That shows just how well camouflaged these creatures can be. And this one gives us a particularly interesting look at how they feed, because we can see its little mouth parts going to town on this bit of algae. Don't they blend in so well with their surroundings? But I saw something move off to the side. And I've heard from a child who we saw filming earlier that there was an octopus over this way. But this was much smaller than the octopus I was expecting to find. And one I'd wanted to film even more than the brown octopus from last episode. This was a blue ringed octopus. They are relatively common but rarely seen and live in shallow water around Australia and the Pacific and Indian Oceans. They don't grow very big, becoming a maximum of 20 centimetres and are a very docile and relaxed octopus who only live for a maximum of three years. There are four species of blue ringed octopus and this one we are looking at is the greater blue ringed octopus. Blue ringed octopuses spend most of their time hiding in crevices, but can change their shape and colour easily using the chromatophore cells like all octopuses. They also pile up rocks against the entrance to their lair to protect them from predators. 
If they feel threatened, they will immediately go from camouflage to flashing their bright blue rings as a warning to keep far away. These are arranged to reflect blue green light and around each ring is a dark pigment which can be expanded to enhance the contrast of the rings making them stand out even more. Under normal circumstances each ring is hidden by contraction of the muscles and when these muscles relax the muscles outside the ring contract and the iridescence is exposed revealing the blue colour. Similar to other octopuses, the blue ringed octopus swims by expelling water from a funnel in a form of jet propulsion. Although all octopuses and some squid are venomous, the blue ringed octopus is something else. Their venom is a potent neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin, which is a thousand times more powerful than cyanide. Each tiny little octopus can contain enough venom to kill 26 humans within a few minutes. They are one of the deadliest animals in the ocean. If you are ever bitten by one of these amazing animals, you don't have long before their venom starts its magic. The venom blocks nerve signals throughout the body causing muscle numbness, nausea, vision loss, loss of senses, loss of motor skills, and eventually full muscle paralysis, including the muscles needed for humans to breathe. There is no known antidote, but victims can potentially be saved if artificial respiration is started immediately. Their bite is usually painless as well, so you won't even know that you've been bitten. But they only bite if threatened and nobody has died from them since the 1960s. So as long as you keep well away and leave them alone, you should be fine. The venom is produced by symbiotic bacteria living in the animal's salivary glands and is more toxic than that of any land mammal. It's primarily used for hunting its favourite prey, such as crabs, shrimp and small fish. They will peck through the shells of their prey with their beak and deposit the fast-acting venom which paralyses their prey and allows the octopus to consume their flesh without the defenseless prey being able to do anything about it. The mating ritual for blue ringed octopus begins when a male approaches a female and begins to stroke her with his arms. The male then grabs onto the female which sometimes completely obscures her vision, then he transfers his genetic material by inserting a special tentacle called a hectococtilius into her body repeatedly. Mating continues until the female has had enough and in at least one species, the female has to remove the over-enthusiastic male by force. Males will attempt to mate with both males and females regardless of their size or age, but interactions between males are often shorter in duration and end without passing on any genetic material or a struggle. The female will lay one clutch of about 50 to 100 eggs which are kept under the female's arms and she hides somewhere she feels safe. Not eating for several weeks until they hatch, at which point she dies. Males also die shortly after mating. When the eggs hatch, the babies are the size of a pea and can start the reproduction cycle the following autumn. I hope you enjoyed learning about all of these awesome creatures and I'll see you on our next adventure. Until then, keep it murky.